Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 53, Being Picky. How to pick what games to play. From Hamilton, Ontario, I'm Sean, and as always, live from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to welcome to everyone here in the Twitch lobby. We start live every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop and continue on even after the Double Bell ends the show for more Off the Books After Show. Uh, for those of you who aren't here live, you can listen in on that after show by joining our Patreon. As thanks for supporting us, you also get other cool stuff like access to our private Discord channel where you can chat with us and other fans of the show, pre-production show notes, behind-the-scene blog posts, and more. Now, today, in addition to talking about picking what to play, I've got a review of Raiders of the North Sea, and during our Tabletop Gaming Weekly segment, I've got a bunch of games that got played on a double date night Dee and I had with Kat and Tori. All right, and I might have a special box to show up to uh, later on in the show. All righty. Sean's going to show it. Never mind. <laughs> We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Each week, we're going to highlight some of those interactions with you fine folk. We'll share some feedback we've received, comments on our content, or maybe some gaming discussions we've been part of. We want to share what people are saying, both positive and negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions. If you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. You can also hit us up on social media where we can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Uh, we got comments from all over the place today, so a few different things to cover. First up are some comments on our last episode and the related blog post, which was on campaign games. Gene Chu writes, My favorite campaign game is Sword and Sorcery. It feels like a lighter version of D&D &D without the need for a dungeon master. Now, since the actual question was about two-player games, I went on to ask Gene if this game plays well with two. He followed up. Yes, the game scales well for all character counts from two to five. I played with all character counts, and the game plays well with all of them. With two players, you can, if you choose to, play two characters each if you want a larger party. It just takes longer with more characters. Well, thanks, Gene. A solid eight game on BGG with a best Ooh. player count of one and three, but a solid recommendation for two. Now, I have to say, the website for this game, the actual manufacturer's website, is horrible. It's got all these fancy graphics, but can you buy the game? Is it possible to buy the game? Is there anywhere in the world you can buy this game? Wow. I don't know until I went to a different website from a related, like, partial publisher of the game who mentioned that now it's now available everywhere else. The actual game website did not give me any indication I could buy wow. this product. Uh, you can though on Amazon, it's up for around 60 bucks on Amazon.com. It, it was another big Kickstarter from what I remember with lots of expansion boxes oh, yeah. you could get. Like that was the deal was it was like you know, almost a cool mini or not uh, style Kickstarter where you get the base game and a million other things for it. But I got to admit, I've heard like no buzz on this. So for a game with that high a rating. Maybe it is that hard to get a hold of that if you didn't back the Kickstarter, you're not part of it. Yeah, if I remember correctly, it had about 2.4K ratings, uh, with an, and it was at an 8.1. So it's not a small number, but it's also not the, you know, 10K yeah. plus ratings that a lot of the, the big games get. I'll have to find out if someone local has a copy and check it out. Now up next, uh, Ivan Sorensen comments... Rocking post, my friend. This is exactly the sort of stuff I feel a lot of board game blogs don't really get into. Well, thanks, Ivan. Uh, that is the kind of comment I love to hear because I like to think we're doing something different here, and it's good to hear that that's being noticed by people. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of choices for board game news and reviews. We don't want to be them. We want to find a place on your listening list as something different, something you won't find elsewhere. Now we move on to the Gokuku review and a couple comments on that. Up first, Evan Edwards writes, Haba does a bunch of fun games that all look like kids' games, but many of which are quite fun for all ages. Well, thanks, Evan. We agree. I know Mo is a fan of Animal Upon Animal, mm -hmm. and I'm sure there are others. Now, Simon Vince writes, The modern version of Kerplunk? Only nowhere for the marbles to go except the floor in this one. Well, thanks for the comment, Simon. 
I got to say, I think we may have a case of reading the title, but not actually reading the review here, because I thought I made it pretty clear how the game works, because Gokuku is really the opposite of Kerplunk, because you're building a nest of sticks to put the eggs into, not trying to make them fall. Now, when they do fall, they tend to fall into the tin, not all over the floor. Now and then, I will admit, an egg does hit the table, but it's not like eggs are going everywhere. Now, our final comment this week comes from Chris Groff, and it's about my 8-bit box unboxing video. He writes, interesting idea, though it sounds kind of gimmicky to me. Well, thanks for the comment, Chris. I'm hoping to try this one out myself when I'm down for the Extra Life event on the 24th. And after that, I'll let you know if I thought it was gimmicky or not. Now, that's it for this week's comments. Thanks to everyone who shares comments and interacts with our content. Yes, thank you all. We record here live Wednesday nights at 9.30 p.m. Eastern on Twitch, and we love people who drop in and take part in our chat room in the lobby. If you're here live, we continue the show after the double bell in an off-the-books after show. Now, people here are already talking about, uh, well, we got kittens in a blender, exploding kittens, the, uh, was it, Trog? Uh, Trogdor. The Trogdor, Trogdor game. board game. But so far, we have one thumbs up from our chat on the Trogdor Kickstarter. Dragon Gem from our chat gave it a, a, a solid thumbs up. Uh, the interesting one to note is Dragon Gem kind of jumped the gun. We haven't gotten to our topic yet, but did note that their husband is working on an app for picking board games. So that's something we're looking forward to seeing. And for Ryan and uh, anyone else who loves the coffee uh, topic, uh, Major Kayla went out and did a double check, and it is Van Hoot, it, uh, Van Hoot. Uh, pronounced correctly. There you go. I thought it was Hout. That was close. Although it could just be the Canadian pronunciation of the two O's, like roof, that someone's probably going, what? Which I don't still don't know how you pronounce roof another way, because, <laughs> well, I'm Canadian, and I used bagged milk to cream my sugar. Well, to be fair, I mean, Detroiters, literally across the river, pronounce it roof. They don't, yeah, that's true. So but that, that's, that's how that different. never actually crossed the river when so many other things did? That's I don't true. Know. But, yeah, that is true. Uh, so from the chat, we already got this going a little bit. What I want to know from you fine folks is how do you go about picking what game to play on game night? Uh, we're going to be talking about quite a few options in our next segment, but I want to know what we may have missed. And if you have a system, especially if you have a unique system, something unique to your group, because in the main topic, we're going to talk about two rather unique ones that I found that were specific to specific groups of people. And I know there's got to be other people out there that have their own unique systems. Well, we'll be back stopping by the lobby a few more times throughout the show. We're here to answer your game, gaming, and game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and, and click on Ask the Bellhop. Uh, social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, the best way for questions to hit us is to come through the website. They won't get missed that way. I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. Now, today's question comes from one of our Patreon patrons. Remember, the patrons get the bonus of having their questions bumped to the top of the question pile. Yuho Rutila writes, We have an established gaming group of five friends. We get to play about every other month, so we want to cherish the time we have found. What would be some of the styles in selecting which games to play? We have now introduced the dealer's choice, so the host of the night gets to pick one game. Selecting the games has not been a problem for us, except we don't all get to play the game we would want. As ever, but everyone is happy, quite happy with the games we play. But what kind of ways have you seen? Voting? Mm -hmm. Dictatorship? Round Robin? A fantastic question, Yuho. Uh, and plus, thank you very much for supporting us on Patreon. Uh, for my usual group, our usual group is kind of similar to your dealer's choice the, that Yuho mentions in his question. Uh, basically, whoever's hosting the game night. Uh, if that's at a public venue, usually one person's in charge of the event. But if I'm going to someone's house or people are coming to my house, whoever's hosting the night does get the first pick. But it's more than one game. What we have is the host is going to pick a selection of games, usually three to five games. But it totally depends on how long the game night is expected to go. But if we're only going to play one game, it's still going to be two or three. So there's options. So the host picks what games are there to be picked from. But then it's the guess the other players that actually pick which of those games get played. Now, guests picking things can actually be a real problem at times, especially if you've got new or unfamiliar people out. Uh, if you don't do that narrowing down first, uh, mm -hmm. sitting down in the gaming room at the Bellhop's place, <laughs> 
<laughs> analysis paralysis is a real problem before a game even hits the table unless you know what you want going in. You know, there's just a lot of board games out there, and if you're yeah. somewhere where the collection is large, it's not an easy choice. Yeah, see, what I'm hosting, what I actually do is I take the games off the shelf and put them on the table so that everyone can see them. Like, here's the pile of what I'm thinking of playing tonight. Uh, I usually then give a quick overview of each game for people who may not know the games. I will point out, if there's one I really want to play, I'll mention it. I'll be like, hey... Here's the games, but I'd really like to play Dinosaur Island. Uh, but if that doesn't get picked, I'm fine, right? As long as I pick, if I'm picking five games, I'm going to pick five games I want to play no matter what. So I'm going to be happy no matter who picks what. Now, if there's a game, um, sorry, if more play more than one game, the one thing we do do is if there's someone that picked the game instead of a group consensus, we make sure the second game, someone else gets a pick, right? So here's my pile of five. Sean's like, Oh, I really want to play that. We play that. Well, then I make sure Deanna then picks the next game from the pile. Uh, now this won't always work for situations with tighter timelines. You might need to already have the game set up before guests arrive. If you don't have that luxury of hours and hours of time to play, uh, you always talking about having just sort of, you know, that, that block of time once a month, so that may be an issue. Yeah, that's true. Because there, there is some more work that goes on behind the scenes, right? Especially with the game nights I organize. And I remember actually the last time Sean was in Windsor and we played um, Shogun. One of the things he was like, man, it was so awesome to show up and have the game set up and ready to play. Right? So that is part of it. Because sometimes if there's a game I really want to play or something I need to play, like I need to write a review on it, I'll let the group know ahead of time, giving them a chance to opt out because I don't want to force anyone to play anything. But then I will have the game set up ahead of time when they show up. Or other times people are itching to try out something specific, and they'll approach me. So that could be a game like, hey, I just bought this. I want to play it. I'm going to bring it to your host, which just happened this past weekend. Or it could be, hey, Mo, do you own this? Because I really want to try it. It goes both ways. And in that case, yeah, sometimes it's not, hey, here's the five games. We know ahead of time what we're going to play. And Good etiquette as the host is, get the game set up ahead of time, especially the first game. And if you can, maybe even set up the second game if you know what it is. Now, this can be key. Uh, it may even be worth generating a list of games available for people, either through Board Game Geek or some other method to help enable this pre-game narrowing down. Yeah, even if it's just a small list. It doesn't have to be even every game you own, but or, or by genre. Hey, what style of game do you guys want to play this weekend? Okay, here's the one I own. Ones I own. Now, the system we have, it works. Uh, it's it's definitely very informal. Like we don't roll any dice. There's no random. There's no outside factor picking what we play. And it works most of the time. Now, sometimes we do run into conflicts where there's players who don't want to play something. That's usually the most common is someone will show up and be like, I don't want to play that at all. Uh, or there will be the I really want to play that. And someone's like, oh, I really don't. More often, though, it's just the group sitting there, even with only five games, spending way too long trying to decide between those five games. Like, you're eating into your precious game time at that point. And that's where having some kind of formal system for choosing games can really come in handy. Using an impartial system can take the feelings out of playing games and remove mm -hmm. any level of indecisiveness. Now, let's talk about some great methods for selecting which tabletop game to play. Uh, the first one's really simple. It's the one that I'm sure every gamer out there has used and has already come up with on their own. And that's some form of completely random generation. Uh, use some form of random generator to pick one of two things. Either pick the player who gets to pick which game gets played or pick the game to be played itself. Roll dice, draw straws, best poker hand, use random.org, whatever you happen to have or you have on hand. Be wary, though, this system, if not carefully used, can generate games which perhaps nobody wants to play. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely true. Uh, this is where you almost want to use this in concert with one of the other tools we're going to talk about, including the, the, the system we use at home where the host is going to pick four or five games. Then maybe a roll of D6 or a D5 or whatever. Yes, D5s exist. Um, the thing with randomly picking games, I find that works the best when you have a group who can't make up their mind. Uh, because you're like, ah, and you're all debating, like, fine, just roll a die. The other thing is it removes any potential hurt feelings uh, because no one made the decision. No one picked it, right? So there can't be, well, Sean picked that game. He always wins. The dice picked it or the card draw or whatever your random generator is. And the other thing, though, is not everyone will get a chance to pick a game in a shorter game night. So if you have five players and you're only going to fit two games, well, only two of those players are going to get the pick. Whereas if you roll two dice, none of the players are left out. They're all left out. 
Yeah, I personally I would lean lean more on randomly choosing who. Uh, or randomly choosing from an already narrowed down selection. So yeah. you've got those five games out there, uh, and, and, and you re- choose from that. Uh, any any wider than that, and you get into trouble real fast. Yeah, because you do have to watch for the hurt feelings, right? That's like Sean would rather pick choosing who. That's fine. If you do use a random generator to pick a player, just make sure you have some way to track that. So the next time you get together, the ne- a different player gets picked. Like just some kind of way that like if you're rolling a D6 and Sean gets picked, well, the next time, next game night, Sean's not eligible to pick, right? Just so everyone has an equal chance to be able to pick the game. This is one of those times where something like Schwazi might not be your friend as it's actually too random. Yeah. Um, it's actually more likely that I would get picked multiple times in mm-hmm. a pure random situation uh, and, and lead to uh, some some thoughts of unfairness. Plus, I don't know, my Chwazi is, like, keyed to my finger lately. I am, like, first player all the time, which is fine, but, like, it's supposed to be random, but, man, I don't know. It, it's starting to seem not so random. So this is another one of my own, okay? I'm going to call it the Blitz Method, and that is because it was developed for something called the Great Canadian Board Game Blitz, which is a tournament. And it's a, a multi-round board game tournament, and this method I find fantastic for large groups of players. Uh, now, this is meant for a tournament of 12 or more players, but it can work anytime. You're going to be playing, say, at least three games, like three separate tables, right? Three different tables of games or more. Well, designed for a tournament, this works just as well for groups playing casually as well. Yeah, I do have one quite twist that I'll get to the end that I think makes it a little more friendly for for playing non-tournament rules. So first round, everyone's ranked randomly somehow. The way we do it is um, we give out playing cards. And then, like, we shuffle the deck, and then we do it in order of the playing cards, though I never remember what if spades is supposed to be first or whatever. But out there, there is a ranking of what order the suits are supposed to be in. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Um, Every player then gets an index card uh, or some kind of score sheet or something with their name on it. Uh, If you're not worried about getting your deck back, they can even write on the card you gave out. Uh, You can use D20s to determine. The problem is when you roll dice, you're going to get too many repeats. That's why I like cards, because once the card's handed out, you can't get that result again. That's also a good point for above. Um, And if you're doing the tournament, I give everyone a score sheet because they're going to keep track of their wins and losses on it. So... Then we have all the games laid out for that round or for the night, whatever the case is. I said this for a tournament, so I'm going to talk as if we're playing rounds of a tournament. So I put out, say, the six games that are potential to be played in the first round of the tournament. The first player, whoever that was randomly determined, is going to put their sheet on the game they want to play. Then the next player puts the sheet on the game they want to play. Now, as soon as one of the games hits four players, because that's what we use for the tournament, those players then take their sheets, take the game, go get a table and start playing. Um... Now, one of the things you have to watch for, though, is watching how many games get picked. You need to make sure that once you hit the right number of games for the number of players you have, you pull the remaining ones out of contention. So say you get a 16-player event. You might have six games on the table, but once four of them have sheets on them, the other two are cleared off. Yeah, a little management, but worth it for those large group sizes. Yeah. So then you, they all play their games, right? Everyone plays their games, your whatever four different tables play. And when they're done, you then get together and you put out the games for the next round. Now, the player picking order is now based on who's winning the tournament. Now, in a blitz, players are going to get points based on how they place first, second, third, and fourth in their games. And they get more points for longer games or shorter games. So it might be one point for a one-hour game, two points for a two-hour game, or three points for a three-hour game, or so on. I, that part doesn't really matter now. What it is, is the player who picked with the most points gets first pick, and then whoever the second point gets second pick and third gets third pick. And in a tournament, that rewards players who are playing well. Now, for friendly game night, I actually suggest you reverse this. So the player in last place gets first pick as kind of a catch-up mechanic. Now, overall, I really like this method of picking games. Everyone I've taught it to really likes this method of picking games, and I find it works great for a large group. But I'm saying you probably need 12 or more people. Like, you're looking at three, four-player games or more. Yep. That's, again, manage, management comes on. So you don't want to use have a system that requires management with a small group because the management overwhelms the actual system itself at that point. Yeah, in this case, like, when I'm running these tournaments, I'm not playing. So I'm... The one I, while the players are playing, I'm getting the next set of games out and so on. I'll even set up the games and then just put the lids on the tables for people to bid and so on. All right. And then next up, we have Board Game Caddy. All right. This is a web-based resource created specifically for picking which games to play. 
It integrates with BoardGameGeek, so you can import your personal game collection, as well as all the other data you put in, like how you've rated games, as well as the weight of the games, and plus all the board game stats all come in. Um, at its most basic, it will randomly pick a game from your collection. Like that's the, the really basic way to use it is just bang, there you go. Here's a, here's a random game from my collection. At its, uh, where it really shines though is when you start using filters. You can filter for number of players, minimum rating, playing time, mechanics, category, tags, weight range, and so on. And so I've brought up Board Game Caddy here on the uh, on the screen so we can all take a look and see what it actually is. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna import uh, Moe's game library. Oh um, no, everyone gets to see my <laughs> board game geek username. Uh, oh, and no, no, it's, it's just gonna take a while. Interesting, because I've done this already tonight and it, it hasn't done that before, which is interesting. Uh, so what it does is it actually needs to import the entire player's... It's because you typoed my username. Oh, I did. I did. <laughs> That'd be uh, the problem. This, yeah. is, this is good, good radio. Oh, excellent. <laughs> All right. That's all right. Everyone listening on the podcast isn't actually hearing this because it will cut out this part. Uh, I was going to say, it should be quick if you get the username right. Yeah, there we go. So here we go. We have the uh, the site. So there's your name, and we've gotten the collection already. So the first thing we get to do is our playing time limits uh, yep. in any group, uh, top and bottom. You can pick expansions or not, and you can hide your four trade games. So if you're if you've got a yeah. bunch of games that are listed for trade on Board Game Geek that you're looking to get rid of, you can hide those as well. It's uh, a nice touch. Yep. Yeah. Number of players. Well, I know Yuho is looking for five, so we'll throw five in here right now. And minimum rating. Well, you know, let's look for the good games. So we're going to look for an eight game. Uh, so from what I could tell, this is actually the minimum rating I've rated the game because it's my Board Game Geek. It's not the minimum Board Game Geek rating, which I oh, like because a nice. lot of these sites. Just pull the board game geek rankings. I want to know my ranking because right. I rank a lot of stuff that's ranked really bad on board game geek really high because I happen to like it. Right. So right now we could roll the dice and it'll tell us we want to play Kalos, which solid I think is game. a very solid recommendation. Yep. But we also have the option to show more filters. So we can actually look for specific mechanics if we want. And we can adjust the player count settings, categories. Uh, and average weight, uh, because we know Mo likes a heavier game, so we can make sure that it's a it's a good four game up there. And then we end up with dominant species. Ooh, really good uh, game. So long, good. <laughs> yeah. So you got a, a two to four hour game, but it's heavy and it's hitting all those points that we've asked for really nicely. Uh, yeah. So overall, I've been really impressed by it so far. Now I I, have, I couldn't find an app version. But I did try the web version on my mobile device on my phone, and it worked great. So I was I, I was pretty happy with that. This seems to be fantastic. For one, it's completely free, so I thought that was pretty awesome. There didn't seem to be any charge. I don't even see a donate button because it's the kind of thing I might throw some money PayPal money to. Yeah. Uh, nope. Since we do have some people in the lobby, our chat rooms here, why don't we take a minute to get a volunteer to do a quick game recommendation? Who out there? We'll just use my board game geek library just because that's uh, we don't I don't need to find out your board game geeks. <laughs> Who has a list? What do you want for a playing time? Whoever yeah. speaks up first is going to go. All right. In the chat room, minimum and maximum playing time that you're looking for in a game. And how, now we learn just how much lag we have. As we load up board game, there so we go. Trash Thirty minutes to six hours. There we go. That's that's a huge range. Number of All players. Right. Number of players. Anyone from one to seventeen plus. And because we have such a lag, I will mention the next one. It will be the minimum rating. All right. So five players. Minimum rating. And then up next is mechanics. The problem is you have to know the mechanics on board game geek to kind of know them. Yeah. Well, we can we can show the less filters too. We can do the easy version. Yeah, that's probably your best. So, so we'll we'll get the the minimum rating. That might have been the five. It was worker placement. There, worker there. placement, and we'll go with that because I'm sure this isn't the best to listen to at home. So we're gonna go with a worker placement game. Uh, we've already got the we changed the average weight to off because we had that from before to any. We'll keep expansions off. Uh, uh, get rid of show not recommended is one of the really good ones. So that's it. This way it won't show player counts that are not right. recommended. Right. And so here it gave us a two to five player 60 minute Tribune Primus Inter Perez. 
That is a game that should be on my pile of shame list, but I know many people who have loved it who have played my copy. I think NG Games has played it. Tribune, it's a card-driven Roman history-based game. Uh, medium weight, some neat card drafting, supposedly better with the expansion. But I got to say, it's a solid recommendation for those requirements, though that was a huge playing time range. So that covers a lot of games. Now, one thing I will note is uh, that, I, that I don't love about this particular site, which is generally best, is... You can't click on this. Uh, some other sites, if you click on the game, it brings you to the Board Game Geek uh, oh, okay. page of it. This one has no click through. So that is one minor, very minor negative. It's not like you can't, uh, you know, just highlight and, and search by Google. Right. <laughs> but, but based uh, on the two we did, I got to say I was impressed by both those recommendations. I know I was playing with this earlier today. Uh, there's some really... Like, this is solid. This yep. It uses some of the best statistics on Board Game Geek to give you a solid recommendation. It filters it very well. I love being able to check it based on my own ratings. Because, yep. like, anything I rate 8 or higher, I always want to play. So as long as I put the rating to 8, I should never be disappointed with the recommendations. And also, I uh, should note that in uh, it, it actually sorts the games, or it, it, it collects all the games that you've... Uh, Filtered, that fit, the criteria. That fit yep. the criteria here, and then you can sort them to look through them as well by a various number of options. So that's also a great thing. So average weight descending, and uh, you know, so right now, right away, dominant species, dominant species. the most, uh, you know, the heaviest, the heaviest game here game. with Kalis and Cavernic, the cave farmers coming in next. Yeah. Um, and then the color coding on the ratings, I have to say, this is this is a solid site, and that's board game caddy c a d d i e dot com. Yeah. Yeah, everything we talk about after this is probably going to pale in comparison, I've got to say, except, except it's a web-based tool and you have to have it there. Yeah. Um, the one disadvantage here is you probably need to do this before your actual game night. You're not going to bring up Board Game Caddy once everyone's sitting around and be like, oh, hold on, let me boot up my laptop and open Board Game Caddy, because then you have to be there where the game collection is, right? And if you're not, that's kind of a problem. So to me, that's something you need to do before it starts. And chat room... Be aware, we are going to come back to you when we get to our next digital tool, and we'll get you yet and again a board game recommendation. But we do have a non-digital tool to get to first. All right, this one didn't have a name, so I gave it a name. Uh, that's Selection by Elimination. Uh, this was from Klaus Gunther Herzog, who is Plow Straighter. They're Plow Straight on Board Game Geek. Uh, he just has a two-step process. One, everyone put one game they want to play on the table. One person, whether that's the host or randomly generated, gets to select an extra game. So the number of the games on the table are the number of players plus one. In my case, I would say the host would get to do this. Now, every player doesn't pick a game they want to play. They instead pick a game they don't want to play and remove it from the table. What's left is the game that gets played. I got to say, I, I've never tried it, but that sounds really solid. Uh, the problem I see is that it needs a group where everyone has their own collection or a shared collection to pick games from because everyone's got to bring to the table. Like for my personal group, I would probably send everyone my board game geek list of games and be like, hey, everyone pick a game off this list. Or if I have enough friends who have games, I'll let them bring their own. This also sounds really solid for public play events where you're expecting people to bring their own games in the first place. Like this might be the next way I might, the next time I'm at CG realm and like Chad's got his games and Sean's got his games and Paul's got his games and I got mine. I think I might tell, try this out and have everyone, Hey, everyone pick one game you brought, put it on the table. And then I don't know, Ian, you own the store, pick one game you want to see. And then we'll try this out. Yeah. It's a certainly straightforward enough system, but I can see how this might still mean someone gets something they weren't really interested in. If you end yeah. up with a group where, you know, everyone really, everyone really, really likes those heavyweight games, except for, you know, one or two people who are looking for something a little lighter that night, odds are they're probably not going to be able to eliminate all the games yeah, that they may that not they want from want. everyone else. And so that you've got that, but again, that's something that uh, you can work in in advance to sort of balance mm -hmm. your group uh, before showing up. Yeah, that's part of the, the that's a topic we're not talking about here, but we've covered many times on the show before is picking which games to bring to game night. So how you the subset of your games that you should be looking at by the before you've even gotten to this point. So up next is pick a game. This is another website. So pick a game that's pick hyphen a hyphen game is another web based resource uh, for deciding what games to play. Now, this site doesn't link to board game geek. 
but it did find it came up with some really good game suggestions. Now, instead of using Board Game Geek ratings and filters, pick a game's more about personal preferences and surveys. Uh, the basic recommendation system that if you just hit start right on the web page has you select a player count minimum age. And then you have four sliding scales. Uh, competitive. Do you want a competitive game versus a relaxed game? Do you want a silly game versus a serious game? A psychological game versus an intellectual game? An immersive game versus a casual game? Uh, from there, it's going to give you a list of three games. Now, those things are all slides that are five-point sliders, so you can go from the middle to the far left to the far right on each scale. So you go, let's play something highly competitive and slide that slider all the way, or you could just leave it right in the middle and be like, eh, I don't care either way if whether we're immersed in the story or not. Um, trying out different levels on the scale, I was going to say I was happy with all the recommendations I saw. So uh, here we've got it up right now. We're looking for a five player uh, with the youngest player who's a teenager. I've gone for something a little more relaxed, uh, but very serious, uh, intellectual, and let's get immersed in the story. And it's got right. uh, something called Snow Trails, The Grizzled, and Sherlock Ooh. Holmes Consulting Detective. Now, I'll admit I personally don't know Snow Trails, but The Grizzled, based on your recommendation, sounds fantastic. You're talking about the trenches of World War II. So you got seriousness and intellectual, but it's a co-op card game where you're just trying to make sure you don't match suits. So there's the relaxed feel. And while well, talk about a story, part of the game is literally telling a story to inspire the other players. So that bang on for those recommendations. Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective, a game where, again, co-op, you're going to try to solve a mystery and do a better job than Sherlock does. And you won't. <laughs> uh, and and <laughs> when you hit more, it does give you three more yeah. options right there. So you can just keep going, too. You can keep too. going. You can keep yeah, it goes on and on. And it's real time, so as I as I click on the buttons and make make my changes, it uh, it you know flips through right there. Right away. Now, uh, Trasharama is say, telling, saying that Snow Tales is a race game. It's uh, one of the Lamont Brothers games. So I thought that was Snow Trails. Uh, but maybe. maybe I'm wrong. So in addition to this basic mode, when you first boot it up and hit start, there's all kinds of other ways to get recommendations. The one I thought that was particularly interesting was the personality quiz. That's going to rank you on a variety of categories. Now, according to the site, I'm first and foremost an expert. Uh, due to my skills in critical thinking, I'm a thinker. I'm secondarily a competitor and empath. Now, I rank really low on party animal and socializer. Well, that sounds pretty close to me. Doesn't sound too far off, far off as far as my board game um, likes are. Uh, from there, it'll recommend games. Now, here's where it kind of fell apart for me. Because recommendations number one and two were Spectre Ops and Fury of Dracula, which are two hidden movement games that are okay. And then up next was Coup, a social deduction game. And I think you know how I feel about social deduction games. So while the quiz was kind of fun to take, I didn't get the best results myself. All right. And so I'm just running through this a little on the quickly, uh, the quick side here as uh as as we play so that people can uh, watch on the video as to what's going on here um and uh so my result is i'm an empath and a pastimer apparently uh with a okay. storyteller as my highest oh, you no know, uh, storyteller, yeah, storyteller is number is, one is number one that uh, definitely and, fits from what i know and so the games it's from recommending for me Takedo, Mice and Mystics, and The Grizzled. Well, I don't know The Grizzled, but uh, I've been looking forward to Mice and Mystics, and I love my Takedo. I play it daily. Yeah. So There you go. I yeah. guess they really like the story aspect of The Grizzled for that to yeah. come up again. Yes. It is a card-driven game. Yeah. Scotland Yard, the classic Scotland board Yard, game. Flashpoint Fire Rescue, yes, and Pandemic Legacy. Well, you yeah. know, that's, it's, uh, so I have to say, um, you know, for a really, really quick blow-through on that quiz, I certainly did not take my time. Yeah. Um, it's definitely uh, come up with some, some interesting stuff. Uh, so the other nice thing, too, is from that, you can also turn on or off kids games. Yep. And you can get rid of fantasy, sci-fi, and horror, which if you're a Euro gamer, you might want to click that button because I actually found my recommendations got way better once I did that. Yeah, yeah Scotland Yard bumped right up there as soon as I did that. And so the other yeah. two options are pick a game uh, basic and pick a game advanced. So you can uh, basically... It's a whole lot more options that you can uh, yeah. tweak, and and basically it's it's no yes, uh, no yes, or absolutely on all of these various selections there mm -hmm. that you can uh, 
choose from. And yeah, that there's is, a, and there's that actually is, a sorry. <laughs> and that is pick a dash game dot com. Yeah, there's actually we blew, 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 blew through that a little quick. There's actually a lot more to the site too. Uh, there's a whole find a game section where you can search by subject, designer, etc. Uh, you can look learn about the different player types. So it actually talks about the different people who play different games. You can meet different types of player types. There's actually a blog and a news section of it. Um, they've broken players into eight different types. Like there's a lot of stuff on this site. And I guess overall, it's a pretty neat site, and it was fun to kill some time on. But I don't think I'd use it that much to pick games versus, say, Board Game Caddy, which we talked about before. Yeah, I I, I personally think PickGame.com is, is a great place to visit once, get a feel for things, maybe play around with sort of getting a feel for what kind of games you, you like based on its suggestions. Uh, and again, you know, spend some time there. You can probably spend an hour here easily just goofing yeah. around and learning about their personality types and where they think that leads. And then I don't think I'd ever go back. <laughs> yeah. So, you know. <laughs> uh, the, the one thing, the one thing uh, you noted this when you were looking at it earlier today, that it may be really good, though, to find something to buy yes. or something new, right? If you want to go shopping. Yep. It may be more useful for that than actually trying to pick games to play that night. Very true. If you're if you if you if you don't have a wish list that's built up already and you're just saying, you know, I want something new and outside that I haven't run into before, this might be the the option for you. All right, chat room, you got a choice. You want to do a really quick game recommendation based on the sliding scale or should we move on? And then up next, we are going to talk about something called Sauce Boss. I think for this, if we're going to do the chat, we'll just go to the basic. So what we need is something competitive. Just rank the four things. So competitive versus relaxed, one to five, with one being competitive, five being relaxed, silly to serious, one to five, psychological to intellectual, one to five, and story, or let's just chat while we're playing, one to five. And the first one to fives we get in a row, we'll toss in and see what games it comes up with. And we're going to keep the kitty games on just because. And yeah, if you zero everything out at five players, you get Peruto, 1812, and High Society. Well, that's just like a ridiculous range. So I guess that fits because <laughs> that's like, wow, that's like you got <laughs> historic war games, a bidding auction game, and a abstract strategy game. Yep. No, that's an interesting, uh, what a, if we go to more, we get ink and gold, pass the popcorn, and for sale. It's going with lighter games in general, it does seem. It seems, well, I think if you, again, if we want to go intellectual, let's try. Yeah, this. there we go. Lords there we of go. Waterdeep, Lords Francis of Waterdeep. Drake, and Kemet. Those yeah. are all solid games. Obviously, uh, I like the the more. Uh, now, I'm interested what it comes up with. You got the with. youngest player as an adult, too, is an interesting. That changes things, too. Yeah. I mean, I'm interested. Let's play something silly, but intellectual. Yeah, yeah. yeah, Rhino okay, so Hero, you got, you, I know. Ghost Blitz, which is actually a really brilliant game where you flip up a card and you look for the thing that's not on the card and you have to grab a physical version of that. So there's like thinking, because you like you immediately want to grab what the pictures of, but no, you can't grab what the pictures of, and no, you can't grab anything that's on the color that's on the card. It's actually really yeah, I can see it. Spyfall is a game where it's a guessing game. And all the players are going to give get uh, like a roll, and then you're going to get a word that you're trying to guess. And one of the players is a spy, so they don't know the word, and everyone else is you're trying to figure out who the spy is. And Rhino here is a dexterity game about building a tower with a rhino in it. Yep. Rhino right, here. Our, our chat room is not playing along tonight. You guys yep. are letting us down. We didn't get any numbers. All right. So we are going to move on to our next Moving our on. next one. I think next time, Sean, you'll just run through one. Sure. For, for when we get to the, yep. the next digital tool. Yep. All right. So this one I did not name. Uh, it is called Sauce Boss, uh, which is an acronym S-A-S-B-A-V-V-S, uh, which the two Vs make a W. Sauce Boss is short for Super Awesome Silent Ballot Absolute Value Voting Systems. Now, if you think those kind of names are fun, you might want to check out a podcast called Out of Game Podcast, because this is where this comes from. This is a podcast I strongly suggest checking out. Uh, they have a very unique take on our hobby. I'll put it that way. Uh, one of my favorite segments is when they compare board games to sandwiches, which is really brilliant. Uh, one of the hosts, Tim's particular views on randomness is 
way out there and very interesting because most randomness comes from other players. Uh, they have this unique method of selecting which games to play. So from their words, not mine, put all potential games out. Everyone gets three votes, max of two per game. Votes can be used as a positive or negative. Example, I could put minus one on Battlestar Galactica and plus two on Scythe, and that would be my three votes. Everyone writes the vote secretly, then someone tallies them up. Now, I haven't personally tried this system, but I always thought this sounds pretty cool. What I really like about this is that you can use your votes as negatives, which is great when you have a player that's like, man, I'll play anything, but not that. Yeah, this is really a more formalized version of selection by elimination with a bit more flexibility and nuance that allows you to sort of shape it without that sort of hard yes, no answer, I think. Yeah, but it wouldn't be elimination if no one votes negative either. You don't have to put a negative vote. You could just put positive. And if you really want to play side, you just put all three votes on side. I think there's it's, it's definitely more nuanced. I think there's more going on to this one than it first appears. And so now we have another web option, which is Board Game Menu. Uh, this is another board game selection site, website. It syncs with your board game account. Uh, now, this doesn't have nearly the number of filters as Board Game Caddy. Uh, it does let you source more places. What I liked about this is you could add multiple Board Game Geek accounts, which is cool if the members of your group each have their own personal game collections. And you can also source a geek list instead of a Board Game Geek user. Uh, there's also an option to source Reddit for ratings instead of Board Game Geek. So what I've done is I've added uh, Gilvan Blight as our uh, Board Game Geek player. So we're just going to do a quick little number of players right here. Number of players you can range as well if you'd like. Uh, youngest player, we're going to go with 16 and older. Now our game sources, every time you do this, uh, it adds another one. So every yeah. time I've gone back, it's, it's, it's re-added. Uh, but we can also add other things here. So we can add currently trending lists or top game lists or uh, geek lists and other uh, and other advanced fields here if we if we would like. Uh, and then we can exclude certain things as well. So we can exclude the, uh, you know, most played in the last week because we don't want anything, you know, we don't want the new the new stuff. That's not us. Now, our rating sources, we can choose the uh, the BGG Geek ratings, or we can use the user's ratings. So, again, we're going to go with uh, the ratings from the bellhop, if I can uh, type. Uh, there we go. And then we're going to get rid of that. And then for weight and preference, let's try a little mid-weight and heavy games right now. And then we're going to generate our menu. And when we say generate a menu, we actually mean generate yes. a menu. Yeah, that's uh, the coolest part about the site to this. Like, this makes an actual physical menu. You get a selection of appetizers, which are up to length 45 minutes. You get four light fare games, which look to be play times up to an hour and a half. And then you get main courses with our games with are longer than an hour and a half or more, which I thought was really neat. I love the look of this. Like, I just want to print this out and, like, hand it out to all the players. Yeah. And so here we have our appetizers, which is Firefly, Out to the Black, Libertalia, uh, Palatinus, 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 uh, Samurai Spirit are our appetizers. Then we move on to our light fare, which is Risk <laughs> Legacy. Uh, I'm not that's... sure if that really counts as light fare. Yeah, um, that's an odd choice. Because, uh, I mean, technically each play might be... Light fair, but, but the thing is, you're not going to break that out as a random selection. Yeah. You're not going to throw out a legacy game. So uh, that that's kind of my problem with yeah. this site, right? Then, like if you scroll up to appetizer, which you may not know, Firefly Out of the Black has come up every appetizer I've run now on this. That is an expansion for a six-hour board game. Why is it giving me an expansion, first off, and second, an expansion for a six-hour game in the appetizer section? Yeah. So this one's a little... I don't know. Like, uh, like the recommendations are pretty decent. I do love the look and theme of the menu. Uh, this is definitely something I do before the game night, and I'd probably like send a PDF to all my players or print it out and actually give it to them, which is kind of neat. Our, our main course was, like, here, yeah, Steam map expansion number three, and well, go Chaos in the Old World, the Horned Rat expansion. Yeah, when you asked for four players, and that's the five player expansion for Chaos in the Old World. <laughs> Yeah, so there so, there are dev we yeah. definitely discovered some problems with this one. I think uh, I think one of the things is if you don't 
put expansions into your board game geek list, then this will be more successful for you. Uh, yeah. That's one of the things I'm noticing. Now, the, I blame the site for that, not the user. The The site should be able to eliminate expansions. Yes, uh, I don't definitely. think that these are all going to be badly done within the Board Game Geek uh, um, section. So I, I do blame the site for this. But if, if you uh, have your Board Game Geek set up the way this site wants, I think it's actually a very pretty and interesting way to do it. Useful? Eh, maybe not as much, but it's very pretty. Yeah, it is. It's nice. I, I love the look. Like, like I almost want to print one of these for the next board game, uh, the board game blitz. Like I talked about running that tournament. So if I actually had a list of the different game rounds, appetizers would be our first game round, late fair would be our second, and uh, a main course would be our third round of the tournament with all the games listed that people can pick from. It just look awesome. Plus, what I do like is under each game, it has a bunch of tags, so it kind of gives you an idea what the games are about. So where you would have the ingredients of the the food item. It actually has the ingredients of the game. I thought that was also a nice touch. And if you click on those ingredients, so if I click on cooperative play, it's actually going to rebuild the list based on based on cooperative play. So yeah. now all these games here will have cooperative play. Which I don't know if I like that because I found when you do that, it no longer is filtered by my list. It's now filtered by all of Board Game Geek. Right. So when you click that, you suddenly may get games you don't own. Right. Again, it's know. got its problem. Now, one of the things you can do, I'm just going to back up a little bit here. You can actually build a custom menu from scratch. So you can actually do a markup and uh, design your own menu in their style, but just put your own board games in by hand uh, and still get that beautiful uh, that beautiful look that they've designed. So that is an option. Um, you know, in this one, it gives you their little T menu here that they've got. So... Yeah, that one's all right. It, it's okay, but if you look, it's just substituting text, right? Like yeah. you, you can probably do that in Word almost as well. Absolutely, but again, it's it's made it. It's already printed it there for design. So I like the fact that they've even got like the wine stains on the menu. You know, yeah, some, it's a nice some touch. nice little touches there. If you're looking, like I would say, this would be a great concept for if you are going to have a gaming event like on a monthly basis at a restaurant mm. or somewhere nice. This yeah. is one of those nice little touches that you can have for the event. No, I, you're not going to use it for your home game night, probably. But for events, it's a nice little option. Yeah, even like our New Year's party, this wouldn't be a bad list if we pick games ahead of time we're going to play. Yeah. But even then, like you you need to be able to edit it or something because, man, uh, there is definitely... Oh, Firefly Out of the Black is the card game. Okay, it, I swear there's an Out of the Black expansion because I swear I have it. Interesting. Okay. Well, we know My we bad. definitely know there are showing some other expansions in there, yeah. though. If not, if not the Firefly one, other expansions are coming up. Very specifically, call, they, things even labeled as expansion. So, all right, all right. Moving on to the next one. So this is one that I completely missed when I was doing the uh, blog version of this, when I wrote the article about this. Uh, this was when Sean found, so I have not really checked this one out except checking it out, like I booted up and did one quick recommendation. But it looks pretty solid so far, and that is Cardboard Butler. Uh, this is another web-based one where you are going to link your Board Game Geek account. You put in your username. Uh, the one thing for those of you watching live right now will note, it is slow. It is very slow at generating results. Yeah. So now what it's come up with right now is its default. So it says right up at the top here, hi, I am Gildan Blight, and you can put in other usernames other than just the one. And I am looking for a game. Now I can choose, I'm going to say in this point, I'm looking for a customizable game that plays in one to two hours with five people. And I prefer games that are complex. So right there, I've got Middle Earth <laughs> and Vampire the Eternal Struggle, Dune CCG, Heresy... Uh, so I'm not sure what custom. Let's go switch over to strategy. customizable game. You just did uh, collectible card games. Oh. So that, that was a bunch of collectible card game recommendations, all collectible card games I own. And those were all the ones I actually like. So right. and here I'll switch over to strategy games. So complex strategy games in uh, in two minutes. We got CO2 as our top mm -hmm. top choice there with brew crafters, planet steam, uh, de vulgaria eloquentia eloquentia. Terraforming yeah. Mars. See, Terraforming Mars is far down that list. That, yep. that obviously doesn't uh, take play yeah, I don't know time what this into is a, filtered account. by. 
Now, the other thing is, this is this randomized, or are you just stuck with the same results every time? Uh, every time I change something, uh, let's see, four people and then back, Go back to five, to five people. people. Yeah, yep. see, so this isn't randomizing at all. No, this is giving you all of the options. Uh, but what I can do is I can go roll five dice. Uh, pick a game for me. Oh, there we go. Here at the top of the list. That's why. Because I didn't. it didn't actually ask me to pick a game. So now I can pick a game for me. Ah, uh, there we go. Okay. And it's picking uh, Rising Sun. There very we go. Fair. And if I re so yeah, it gave you a list of every game. Yeah. Oh God, Shafosa! Uh, <laughs> I gave you a list of every game that meets the criteria, which isn't a bad thing. Right. But I was like, this isn't picking anything for me. It's just telling me all the games I own. Yep. These are all solid recommendations. So, and I don't think you put anything in for a rating. So this this fits. Yep. Uh, let me just see here. What do we got? Uh, rating filtering. So uh, we can filter games on rating as well, and then pick I a game. What it's Steam. By. That's a fantastic fight. Manhattan player. Project. Yeah. Solid. And Nobleman. Uh, okay. I, I don't might think have ever heard her. you mention that game. So. No, I, I've only played it twice. <laughs> Concordia, we know oh, you're talking. Really good. Yep. Yeah. And uh, In the Year of the Dragon. There My go. favorite Feld. Yep. So, yeah, these are definitely solid recommendations. Really solid recommendations. So, this this looks good. Yep. Like, really good. For one, I completely missed. The, the, whoever does the SEO for Cardboard Butler, give me and Deanna a call because we might be able to help you out. Because when I Googled for picking board games, your site did not come up. Yeah. And uh, do they have a uh, data is from Board Game Geek? They do. Uh, so they, they just tell you to support uh, Board Game Geek, actually. Um, huh, that's cool. So it's a web a web page that decides you to help you decide the next board game to play. Uh, may, created and maintained by Philip Christofferson. Uh, send him a message and say hi. So we should uh, we should definitely mention to him, to him that we've mentioned uh, thing. And Sounds if good. and if you've got new, he's got a Trello board that's open that uh, is that's his feature list. So uh, very cool. So not cool. looking for any compensation. That's always awesome when yeah, someone so wants to get I, back. I don't know if he's got a good list. Uh, I would recommend googling cardboard butler because the actual website is cardboardbutler.blob.core.windows.net. And that, that, um, as I said, SEO, give us a call. <laughs> Hopefully, uh, yeah, yeah. So that's that. All right. All right. And we have one more. Uh, I don't know how much we can talk about this because I haven't tried it myself, and I don't think Sean's had a chance to try it yet. But one of the things I tried to find was an Android app. Uh, I did not check iOS. The only thing I have that's iOS anymore is an iPod Touch, and it's an older generation and doesn't do the Internet well anymore. Uh, but I did grab my Android phone, and I had no luck. Like I know there's got to be apps out there. Um, we do know Dragon Jam's husband is working on one, but stuff that's already out there. Now, Sean did manage to find one. Um, I Board Game Companion. So this one looks to me, it's it's very familiar. It, it felt a little bit in the quick little snapshots I saw of the uh, the board game stats app I already I already use. Uh, but it's pretty simple. It pulls your data in from BGG, uh, or you can do your own list. Uh, and it's basically just a simple. It's 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 a collection management app first and foremost. Okay. Uh, it also helps you do the ten by ten challenges and things like that uh, built into it. Uh, but it doesn't appear to have any sort of a record keeping thing like board game stats. It is really just a collection management and, and challenge a, and it has and challenge management. Now, is there a way to pick a random game? Uh, and it does have yeah, and it does have the the random game uh, option okay. in there as well. So uh, it's got a choose game, the challenges, and collection are its three the three different tools hmm. listed uh, within the app. What's interesting about that is don't you have to pay? board game stats to be able to do the challenges. Um, so I wonder if you possibly. use these two tools together, you can save some money. Possibly. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know how flexible it is. Like uh, the one thing about the board game stats is that you can do any challenge you want. Uh, mm -hmm. This one is, is the 10 is talks, but talks specifically about the 10 by 10. I'm not sure um, what it is, but just an option out there. And uh, we'll have a link in the show notes if you want to find that one. Yep, uh, we'll toss that in when I do the notes. All right, and so that wraps up our game night selection tips and tools. Let's see if our lobby has anyone to add. Uh, we, we were corrected on our Firefly. <laughs> yeah, my bad on that. There's, I have something that's the black that is one of those small pack expansions for the big Firefly board game. My bad. But we did see like Steam map pack number three come up as well. Like ex expansions are definitely filtered in somehow. 
yeah. my bad on not recognizing uh, the Firefly game. I have okay, that's weird because I don't own that. <laughs> so why would it come up? Okay, that's even weirder. I got to look at my board game geek collection and figure out what fire because I don't own an out of the black card game. Interesting. Maybe it's into the black instead of out of the black. Hmm. Into. There you go. No. Well, there are five the, pages of out Firefly to games. The black so. Is a card game that I definitely don't own. <laughs> That's weird. So I don't even know why that came up. Interesting. What if I just do Firefly Black? Yeah, out to the black brown coat bonus pack and the Serenity bonus pack. So there's nothing. For some reason I have this listed as own want to play and I do not. Interesting. Own this or want to play it. Remember when I told you we were missing a Firefly expansion? That's for the problem. This is the one. So I don't know what happened there. Interesting. Because I'm like, I don't own a prior game. <laughs> so I didn't say it. So everyone in the chat must, how do you guys pick games? Before we move on, do you just like have a big fight about it? Just do you have an alpha gamer who just shows up and goes, we're playing this tonight? I know that's a thing, right? Like uh, Yuho mentioned dictatorship. It happens. Yep. Absolutely. Um, definitely. Like whenever I've gone to my friend Jamie's house, it's always, we're going to Jamie's to play games. Jamie picks the games. Like you show up now, Jamie has a great collection of games and doesn't tend to pick bad games. Um, <laughs> everyone avoids making a decision until someone finally does. So that's, that's the AP version. Yep, of, yep. of board game selection. That's not one I recommend. Nope. Uh, the, someone gets frustrated that it's taken so long to pick a game, they just pick something. Usually that ends up with someone pissed off they got to play something. Usually the reason no one wants to pick is there's probably something they don't want to play, but they don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. It's also the Canadian version of board game selection, I think, is the, oh, no, no, you pick. No, no, after you. No, 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 you. you pick. No, no, you, you brought the games. Come on, you pick. That's fine. Uh, yeah, no, I oh, have I mean, to say, I, when I, I have the Alpha Gamer Pro, I show up and when that happens, I go, okay, I want to play this. Yeah. And then there's usually someone's like, oh, I didn't want to play that. And I'm like, well, I, I didn't just say see, something. See, and I appreciate the Alpha Gamer thing because, again, I walk down into your basement and drool and, <laughs> and stare blankly and completely forget the nine different games that we yeah. have talked about on this show that I want to play. Yeah, you want to play. Because <laughs> that's usually what happens, right? Like, I'll, I'll, like, if Sean's down, I'll have a pile of three. Again, I'll have a pile of three or four. I'd be like, hey, yeah. here's the ones I think you'll like. But then they'll usually get to the point where I'm like, all right, what else did you want to try? And it's like, uh, what did we um, talk about on this shit, show? I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, what do we actually know how to play? That that was one. I didn't see, there, there's no board game filter for, I could teach this. Like, that'd be a really nice filter. Because then you could tell me, like, here, show me the games I know how to teach. Would be a cool filter. Yeah, that uh, would actually, you'd actually, you'd need to, uh, I mean, you need to put a, another board game geek column in, is, you know, own, want, teach. You know. Although you could you could cheat if you use like the want to play because I don't know if people use that much. I use it to figure out my pile of shame. But if you use the want to play tag because most people don't use it, you just use that for the games you can teach. But again, I don't think any of these sites filtered for want to play. No, but I I mean that that last one you know he's he's in active development on the project. Yeah, so true. I'm sure we get him to throw it in if if we got Board Game Geek to throw it in. Although they they just aren't. I I haven't had the greatest. Uh, conversations with board game geek on twitter at least so we'll uh, maybe maybe i'll run into them at, at origins next year and uh, have a chat yeah i've seen aldi there i've never actually bothered to talk to aldi not that i have anything bad to say yeah all right well if you've got any questions for us head over to the website click on ask the bellhop email us at questions at tabletop bellhop.com because uh, so that's it for this week's Ask the Bellhop. If you'd like to read more gaming, gaming, and game night topics like this, be sure to check out the blog at tabletopbellhop.com and click on Gaming Advice. We keep growing with the support of fans like you, so if you haven't yet, please take a minute to subscribe, like, rate, review, click on the bell, thumbs up, or share with your friends. Wherever and however you find us, you can help us grow. Sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox. Once a week, I send out an email that recaps all the content we've released in the week previous. Uh, blog posts, new podcast episodes, reviews, new YouTube videos, and anything else we create, it's all linked there. You can sign up at newsletters.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to the tabletopbellhop.com webpage where you'll find a spot to subscribe in the sidebar. Uh, we almost launched the Zentico giveaway. I was going to do that instead of the Raiders of the North Sea 
review that I published and we'll get to in a minute. But then I realized everyone's at Gen Con. So I figured we'd be better off holding off a week. So the plan is to get it live this week, uh, probably by Friday. For those of you who listen to our podcast, this should mean the review and giveaway are live now. You should be able to find that over at tabletopbellhop.com under reviews. All right, August 24th, I want all of you to join us for our Extra Life warm-up event. If you're local, come on down to CG Realm for 12 hours of gaming goodness from 10 a.m. till 10 p.m. If you can't join us live in person, tune into our Twitch channels where we'll be streaming the entire event live. During the event, we're going to be looking for your support. Uh, we're hoping to be able to accept donations live on stream, and if not, we'll be hooking you up with an appropriate donation link, probably through Nightbot, or we'll just keep sharing it, or it'll be below the stream. Yeah, I expect uh, there should be a donate button now but that will uh, show up below our stream. So quick and easy, click that to go. If you're raising money for Extra Life yourself, we invite you to join our team. You can find a link to that in the show notes. Uh, this is only the first step on our Road to Extra Life 2019. Next month, we've got an RPG event planned. The month after that, we've got a board game blitz tournament, which we were talking about earlier today. And then we have the big event itself in November. For more information on all of our 2019 Extra Life efforts and events, head over to WindsorExtraLife.com. All right, up next, I want to talk about one of the hot new games I got at Origins 2019, Raiders of the North Sea from Renegade Game Studios. Yeah, I know. Some of you are probably thinking, what the heck? New? Raiders of the North Sea came out in 2015. Well, sorry, it's new to me. And yeah, I know I'm late to the party here. The newest old games anywhere on Twitch. <laughs> hey, we did stream Cats. I don't think anyone's done that yet. I think we may have a record for streaming the oldest produced game. Although there's probably people playing chess, so I probably can't claim that one. But at least kids games. Now, I gotta admit, I, I have no idea why it really I, it took this long to get around to Raiders of the North Sea. Like, I remember when it came out, it had rave reviews. I, I remember some of my favorite podcasters talking about how much they enjoyed it. Heck, I even did a demo of it at Origins 2018, back at the at the Renegade Game Studio booth, and I really liked what I saw. Now, it was only a demo. I just never got around to actually getting a copy of it, and I didn't know anyone else local that had it, or if they had it, they weren't bringing it out to local events. Now, I got to say, you know what it is? It's it's what we've talked about many times on the show, and that's the current state of the board game industry. There are just so many games that come out each year that it is ridiculous easy to miss a good game or even a great game. And that's basically what happened here. I was busy playing other games, hyped about other stuff. Raider than North Sea just flew right under my radar until now. Well, visiting Origins 2019... I managed to snag a review copy from the Renegade Studios booth and finally gave this worker placement slash removal system a try. So what is Raiders of the North Sea all about? Well, I already mentioned that it's, it was uh, by Renegade Games, came out in 2015. Uh, it's by Shem Phillips and features art by the awesome Mihalo Dimitrivsky. I probably pronounced that wrong, and there's a reason people call him Miko. Uh, I love Miko. There's a little side note about Miko that really doesn't have anything to do with Raiders and Rusty. Like, I first saw Miko's art in Valeria Card Kingdoms. Like, Sean's seen this now, too. And I am a huge fan of his art ever since playing Valeria. And yes, I realized Valeria came out after Raiders of the North Sea, and I, I told you, I'm late to the party here. Okay, so it's beautiful. And I think from the title, we can assume Vikings? Yeah, definitely Vikings. That is the entire point. This is a two to four player game. You play in about an hour and a half. Uh, depending on the player count, it's actually quicker with more players instead of the other way around because things get rated quicker. Uh, you are playing a tribe of Vikings doing the things Vikings did best, raiding, collecting plunder, and also trying to impress your chieftain. Now, in order to go raiding, you need to assemble your crew, collect provisions, and improve your armory. All of this is done using a unique, and I got to say totally brilliant, worker placement slash removal system. So 
We know the bellhop loves his unique systems. Yeah, definitely do. And this is one of them. Because at the start of the game, uh, you have a small hand of crew cards, three of them, some starting silver. I think it's two. Uh, you use the silver to hire more crew and you have one Viking worker. Uh, this happens to be black colored at the start of the game. Each round, you're going to decide if you're going raiding or if you're going to work back in the village. This is done by placing your one worker on a spot and then resolving with that spot. So it's typical worker action there. It's all the same. But then here's the brilliant part. You now remove a worker from the board. Now, if you're raiding, it's a worker you're rewarded for raiding. But if you're taking a worker off another working spot in the village, you then get to resolve that action. And then at the end of every turn, like the one thing always to remember is at the start of your turn and the end of your turn, you always have one worker left in your hand. Okay, so work or raid, that seems simple enough. That hardly seems that unique, though. Yeah, the unique thing, though, is the fact that it's worker placement and removal. Putting the worker out, you do something, and taking a worker off is what really is the brilliant part. It's You take Kalis, and instead of just putting your guys out on the field, you're taking one off and also doing something. Now, these worker action spots do things like let you draw new cards, play crew cards for an action, gain silver, spend your silver to place more crew into play, uh, give tribute to the chieftain, gain provisions, and improve your armory. Now, some of these require gray or white workers. Now, you can initially only get those through raiding, but because of the unique worker placement removal system, once someone else places one of those leveled up workers, you're free to remove it and get that worker yourself. Now, raiding requires a set number of crew members, a number of provisions, and sometimes some gold. Now, one thing I like about this game that to me puts it above some other Viking games out there is every raid is going to get you plunder, no matter what, and some victory points, no matter what. The plunder is in the form of gold, iron, and cattle. Some raiding spots may also have what they call Valkyries, the little skull tokens. And when you take those as plunder, you have to kill members of your crew. Now, remember, this is a Viking thing game. So that's not really a bad thing because the dead go to Valhalla and will score you some endgame victory points. Now, most raiding spots give you a variable number of victory points, and this is based on the strength of your crew, which is determined by your crew members you have in your in your, your boat, in your raiding party, and your armory level, and sometimes you roll special D6s. Now, these aren't normal D6s because the sides are 2, 3, 3, 4, 4, 5. Now, even if your crew's not strong enough, even if you fail at the raid, you still get all the plunder no matter what. Well, now that's definitely sounding more interesting and unique. <laughs> Now, victory points are received for having your armory leveled up, for the number of crew you sent to Valhalla, and for giving tribute to the chieftain. Now, this is you have to give him certain sets of plunder, and it's determined by random tiles. Uh, the game ends when those tiles run out, or if there are no more Valkyries on the table, or all that's left in the range you're raiding is one fortress. Uh, now, that's still pretty high level, even though I did get into some details. I do think that gets across the main gist of the game. Now, a lot of the game gameplay is based on the crew cards because each crew has a strength level in red, a cost to hire in silver, and two abilities. One that happens when you play the card as crew, but then there's also another spot where you can discard the card to do an action. So uh, this sounds like a, an interesting game, and I, you've, you've talked about it any number of times now playing with a variety of different play players mm -hmm. and, and enjoying it. Uh, one thing I noticed was this is the uh, 2018 Mensa Select winner, or one of the one of the five 2018 Mensa Select winners. And I took a quick little look at that and and noticed that you really seem to like your Mensa Select winners and should probably <laughs> be shopping a little more off that list. Oh, uh, let's probably. say the other one of the other 2018 Mensa Select winners was Azul. Huh? Uh, one of the 2019 winners uh, is gizmos and mm -hmm. planet uh <laughs> so there's definitely something about the mensa select category that uh there appeals to you or they should add me as a judge that, that might oh, be a better way to do it well yes so we talked about the mensa judging yes, that's, that's just true. a horrible situation <laughs> uh, that is true we did yeah, 48, listen, listen 48 to our, hours of gaming yeah. um listen to our gaming awards podcast for more talk about the mensa select awards Absolutely. i'll admit it one of the first games i remember buying that was a mensa game was Gravwell, so that's another one i like i obviously like that the style of games i like i'm surprised by this one being on their list though because usually their games are lighter which i i wouldn't call this a light game it's not heavy but yeah it's, them... it's, it's not as light as the other games you just mentioned yep 
Uh, so, you can find a written version of this review over at tabletopbellhop.com. In addition, be sure to check out our unboxing video on YouTube. And now, Tabletop Gaming Weekly, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit the table? Uh, every week, we like to take this look back at the games we played, any events we attended, and other cool gaming stuff that's going on. You can catch the blog version of this week in review at tabletopbellhop.com under On Our Tabletop. This past Saturday, Deanna and I had a gaming double date night with Tori and Kat, who most of you will know from our Gloomhaven streams. Uh, besides some good food and drink, the four of us got in quite a few games. Uh, and even managed to tease your co-host from afar. <laughs> Just a bit. We should have live streamed at least that part. Uh, we did start off the night. Uh, we met at the Sandwich Brewing Company. I've mentioned this a couple times in the last weeks. Uh, this is a fantastic brewery, some great beer. Uh, and I got to say, the best charcuterie boards in the region. Like, wow, really impressive charcuterie boards. And popcorn and uh, pretzels is the only thing on the menu. It's all they do uh, is beer and charcuterie boards. Uh, after ordering a round of drinks and a couple of boards, I took out Gokuku because uh, everyone loves this game, right? Despite gaming with Tori and Kat at least once a week, including on Fridays where we play Gloomhaven, neither of them had actually had a chance to play Gokuku yet, which I felt a little bad, actually, for how much I talked about the game. Uh, of course, they loved it, and as I said in the review last week, everyone I show this game loves it. Uh, Tori, in particular, kept noting, he's like, wow, this is this is really good. Oh, this is really brilliant. He, he did really dig it. Yeah, you know, I have yet to see anyone complain about this game, even slightly. Yeah. I, 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 seriously, universal appeal. The, I'm, there's got to be someone out there that hates it. But, like, even people who hate dexterity games seem to like this for some reason. Uh, up next, I brought out the unfortunately named game, The Game. I still, every time, I I can't even find it. Like, if I got to find this game on Board Game Geek, I go to Am or Google and search The Game Board Game Geek because The Game comes up with too many categories. Who, who named this thing? But anyway, it's a very simple to teach cooperative card game. Uh, it's one deck, uh, and it has one card each number 2 to 99. Uh, each player starts with six cards, and then you have four piles that you're playing cards into. Two of the piles are going up, and you're looking for number one to 100. The other two piles are going down from 100 to 1. Uh, the numbers on the starting cards, because you have cards that start the piles, are 1 and 100. Each player has to play at least two cards, and the rule is you have to either go up or go down. So if I play a two, it's got to go on a one card. If I play a five and it's on the go up card pile, you know, the going up piles, you have to go up numerically upwards, and the going down piles, you have to go numerically downwards. Uh, the goal is to play all 98 cards. Now, there is one special rule that lets you cheat, and that is if you can play a card that's exactly 10 apart from the card that's on the top of one of the piles, you can jump backwards. So if you're on the going up pile, you can play a card that's lower, and if you're on the going down pile, you can play a card that's higher. Uh, now, what Deanna and I usually aren't big cooperative game fans, we do dig playing them with Tori and Kat. That group works. Like, all cooperative games are very group-dependent. Uh, we learned this by playing through a full campaign of Pandemic Legacy with that couple. Uh, and now we're playing Gloomhaven, right? Another big co-op. And we found playing co-op games work really well with our particular group. Yeah, it's hard to go wrong with a group that's been gaming together in co-op situations for common goals for so long. Yeah, I think we might be up to three years now. Like, it's it's we're into our second year of Gloomhaven. If you added in Pandemic Legacy, yet, it, I think it might even be three years of getting together, mostly, most Fridays. Mm -hmm. um, so getting back to the game, we did play two rounds. The first one was rough, uh, but it was a learning game. Like, I had played my copy of the game a couple times before, but it had been a long time. Everyone else was brand new to them. Now, the second game, though, man, we rocked it. Um, overall, the game was way better than I remembered it. Like, for such a simple concept, right? You have a deck that's numbered two to 98 and you got to play them in order like that's it i it works really well and plus this was just the perfect game for that atmosphere right we're playing in a brewery we it doesn't take a lot of room we got charcuterie boards there we're talking about work we're talking about outside stuff and we're playing it didn't take all of our focus and we can continue to have other conversations yeah, it's a perfect example of that kind of dinner game and conversation game that we've talked about for both space and concentration. 
Yeah, I totally agree. If it, if it wasn't on my list of games to play at a pub and cafe, it should have been. And I don't think it was because I hadn't played this one in some time. Now, this next one was on our list, and I remember that clearly because I've recommended it often for playing at cafes and bars and that, and that is Red 7. Uh, this is another quick-to-explain card game. Uh, I, again, I think it's perfect for this type of venue because the only rule in Red 7 is at the end of your turn, you must be winning, otherwise you lose. Each turn, you have to play one card from your hand. You can also discard a card to change the rules of the game. When you do that, you must be winning. Each deck has eight color, or the deck has eight colors with seven cards in each color, number one to seven. Each color represents a different rule. And the rules are things like the highest card, most cards in a row, most cards of the same color, and so on. Yeah, and we've spoken about this one several times in the past. Yeah. I gotta admit, I, I love Red 7. I've loved it since I first discovered it. Uh, Tori and Kat also seem to dig it, but I do have to admit, Deanna found that playing with the full rules made the game go on way longer than she would have liked. Because you can play this in a variety of modes. Like, there's just a basic mode where you just play through a hand and someone wins the hand, and then you play another hand and someone wins the hand. You just keep kind of doing that. Uh, she seemed to like that better. I think we would have been better off playing multiple single rounds instead of playing with the full scoring rules where some cards are removed from the deck and there's more of a mount, more of a memory element. I think in this particular case with us having outside conversations as well as drinking adult beverages, might have been better off just playing the light who cares who won version. Now, after Red 7, full of cured meats, cheese, nuts and fruits and craft beer, we headed back to my place for more gaming. Uh, now, when we decided we were going to get the other Saturday night, Tori right away was like, hey, we got to play a game off my pile of shame. And that was the DC deck building game Confrontations version. This is a standalone team based version of the classic DC deck building game you hear Sean talk about on most weeks of the show. Uh, one team's going to play the villains. The other team's going to play the heroes. And instead of attacking a character deck that's placed like in the center of the table, the teams are attacking each other. Which, of course, they had to rub it, rub it in over Twitter because I didn't have it yet. <laughs> uh, for this game, we played Girls versus the Boys. Uh, Tori and I took on the hero side. The girls played the villains. Uh, I played Aquaman. Tori took Superman. Deanna chose Lex Luthor. And Kat played Circe. Now, I played the deck building game, DC deck building game in the past. Uh, uh, not a lot. I've only played it a couple times. It's not a series of games that I personally own, and I haven't played any of the versions of it very often. So I'm probably not the best person to try to compare this new version versus the original, but I'll do what I can. I do feel it felt more engaging because I remember feeling very taken out of the story when it was just all of us are randomly attacking this deck. This was very much confrontational. I was very, very much attacking each other. And one of the things, if I remember correctly from the other game, is when you defeat the villains, they go into your deck, which tends to lead to a runaway leader problem because whoever beats the villains gets the better cards in their deck. Where in this one, you don't. You just remove the big oversized card. Everyone has three big oversized cards. And that hero then gets new powers. And based on their cards, generally gets better because a lot of the cards add the attacker or the, the character's level to it. And as you beat them up, their levels get higher. Uh, so that part was neat. I, I did like that aspect to it. So it definitely removed that from the original game. Yeah. So what, what confrontations is, is it's now a team based expanded version of what started off as the rivals. So mm -hmm. uh, there's the rivals, Batman versus Joker and rivals Sinestro versus green lantern, uh, which are a sort of one-on-one -on -one rivals. Now confrontations has taken that and brought it up to the next level where you have full on team based battles okay. of, of good versus bad. Yeah, Tori did note it's also compatible with those two decks. Where if you have rivals and if you have uh, if you have the Batman and the, the Green Lantern, you can mash that all in. Yeah. Now I gotta admit we had fun, but it wasn't great. Um, one problem we had for sure on my big table is I'm getting old, and the font on those cards is very small. Um, unlike say a Star Realms, where the big important power is like a big symbol. This is little tiny text that says power plus two with the word assist maybe, and maybe a bunch more text. So we had to keep picking up all the cards from the purchase row. Uh, so a lot of the game was three of us sitting back while someone read all the cards and then put them back. Uh, the other issue I found was that the cards had lots of fiddly abilities. Uh, they didn't just do one thing. Like there were, I, I don't even know if there's a card in the deck that was just plus three power. Everything did that and more. Um, Every, there's a new thing called assist abilities uh, and the assist abilities had you looking up things and talking to your partners because you could play your assist abilities on your opponent or not on your opponents, your allies. And then 
um, there were all kinds of things we had to look stuff up. Like this card would give one power for every seven cards in your discard pile. So here I am having to count my discard pile every turn. Or this card is played and it does this unless it's played with an equipment card. In that case, it does that and so on. Like, I personally wonder if this is due to the fact this is one of the later expansions to come out and they're trying to one up the last edition. So they just keep adding more abilities and kind of bloating some of the cards. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Uh, the um, uh, the helper cards, um, sorry, the uh, assist assist. Uh, it isn't the first time they've used it, uh, but it's not because of I forget which expansion it came out in that I've got, but it hadn't really come up too often for us yet. So I'll, I'll be interested to see how that one particularly plays out. For me personally, uh, while the eyesight thing is a problem, I don't have a big, as big a table as you, so it's not perhaps as big a problem. Uh, personally, though, I like the, uh, the combination of powers. I find the, the working on building your, your card combos and trying to, to, to collect, you know, this card is fine, but it's even better with this card sort of combo. Right. Uh, that is, for me, part of the fun of the deck building. Um, so I, I don't mind that particular, uh, I guess mechanic bloat, it could be called Mm -hmm. if you, uh, if that isn't your thing. Uh, and that's totally a valid point. Uh, it's, it's, again, you're not, that's not necessarily your type of, of deck builder as much. Yeah. And I, and it might not have bothered me as much if I played without it. Like if it was a slow evolution of, I played the original game and all the cards are plus one power, plus two or plus three power. And now it's all plus two power in this. I'd probably be even be relieved that there's more to the game now, but, uh, like part of it too was, it was our own lack of focus, right? Like our game night did start at a brewery after all. (laughs) Um, well, it, it, it was long. It was a very long game. And some of that was because we got distracted playing YouTube videos for each other and finding out that, um, oh, I forget what it was. There was something Tori and Kat had never heard of. And I was just shocked because I forget they're younger than us sometimes. And we had to have a whole sidetrack to explain the thing. Um, overall, well, confrontation seemed pretty cool. I, I think it played pretty well. It was okay, but I think it just mainly needed more focus than we were capable of that game night. Uh, right now, I would give it another shot, but I won't be rushing out to buy my own copy. Yeah, and one of the things that helps about the game is definitely familiarity. Um, and again, and that goes partially to the reading problem as well. Mm. Um, the first few times I've had DC down on the table, you know, I was I, I would do a lot more picking up. But then you get used to the fact that, oh, that's Superman's yeah. cape. That's Batman's belt. That's, right. you know, and, and the cards become more familiar. And, and even when they, they introduce new cards... Uh, you, you get to f- a little bit of a feel for when they're referencing certain uh, characters. So you have a feeling that Wonder Woman's cards are going to tend in a certain direction oh, that's and a certain power. They, and th- there is, I mean, it's it's not a, a guarantee, but it's a good it's sort of a way of judging things uh, that they do tend to sort of keep the characters, mm-hmm. you know, in a, in a path to some degree. See, that that would be something I think may be completely different in confrontations, because one of the things Tori pointed out is that every character card is unique. There are no duplicates. There is no two Wonder Woman cards. There's one. So no, but there, there, there wouldn't be any of that building but there's the, on... the Wonder Woman, the Wonder Woman, uh, Wonder Woman's lasso is usually a card and, you know, like uh, your invisible jet or something, you know, oh, okay. yeah, there's yeah. all those different, the power cards are related, right. the you know, equipment and stuff. yeah, okay. like, like Batman is normally an equipment building Right. Uh, card, whereas Superman is a power building sort okay, of uh, set. I understand uh, now. I, I thought you were saying like you collect multiple Wonder Woman hero cards. And villain no, no, cards. your hero, your hero is your hero. That's uh, um, uh, yeah. So anyway, I, I'll give it another shot. Maybe when you're down, I don't know. It, it was okay. Like I said it, it probably wasn't the best choice. Which uh, we're going to continue that trend because the final board game of the night is Raiders of the North Sea. Um, we just talked about that. I love it, right? Uh, this was probably a mistake breaking this out as the last tabletop game of the night. Um, I just, I like the game so much and neither Tori or Kat had played it yet. And I'm like, oh, I have to show Tori and Kat this awesome game. Now, Kat did seem to dig it, but she was the only sober person at the table at this point. Tori, on the other hand, just didn't really grok the rules. And I'm not blaming Tori here. Like, like. There, there were, there was alcohol involved, including some harder alcohol when we got back to the house. Now, Deanna and I, having played before, were fine, but it, I think this was a mistake bringing this one out as late as I did. I just hope I didn't spoil Tori on it completely. Like he's not willing to try it again. I, I'm assuming he's probably good with giving it another shot when we can spend more time and focus on the game. Yeah, it's uh, 
thinky thinky games and alcohol are are yeah. not always the best choice. And then when you say thinky games, alcohol, and one thirty in the morning or something like that, yeah, it was, it was late. pretty late. Yeah. Um, so I probably not just just a wise choice. Yeah, it, it was a bad choice. My bad. I, I wasn't thinking clearly myself. Now, I did say it was our final tabletop game. Um, I did word it that way on purpose because the night was far from over. Because after that, uh, we moved over to the other side of the room, turned on the Xbox, set up the drums, passed out some guitars, grabbed the mic, and finished off the night with some Rock Band 4. Uh, playing through the absolutely amazing rockumentary mode, which I strongly recommend. But I'm going to stop talking about that because this is a tabletop gaming podcast. And I won't bother going into any more details about that video game. Though I will say it was a ton of fun and we didn't finish till after 6 a.m. Uh, even regular listeners of this show might be surprised to learn that the Bellhop is a true lover of rock oh, yeah. band. I love that game so much. That's a game that gets played the most on my... I, I probably wouldn't have an Xbox One if it wasn't for rock band. All right. So how about we look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming week? Uh, so one thing I realized about this segment when I was doing the show notes today that for some reason never really clicked in before is that I'm often talking about really cool stuff that's going on in Windsor. Like, hey, I'm looking forward to this game night that's happening on Saturday. What I realized, though, is most people who are going to hear this aren't going to hear this till Tuesday. Uh, so one thing I'm going to try to remember to do is talk about events that are currently two weeks out here in Windsor, because I know we do have a lo lot of local w Windsor listeners, which is awesome. But unless you're in the chat room right now, me telling you this awesome thing that's happening Saturday really doesn't help get the word out. So to that end, this weekend, so this is the one you've missed, I am hosting a summoner game night sorcerer wow i wrote that wrong in the notes sorcerer from white wizard games uh that is the hot new dueling magic the gathering next step game from white wizard games famous for their card games like epic uh hero wars and i uh, star realms uh this is a big deal this is a huge game i've got a copy straight off uh off them from origins the store has gotten extra copies in because we're confident people are going to dig this game now what's going to be interesting i may be doing demos all night and it's a two-player game so we might have to have people watch like you can play three or four i plan on just doing two-player demos but yeah if you're in windsor and you're listening right now come out to cg realm five o'clock till 10 p.m i am bringing my copy of sorcerer you got to check this game out it looks fantastic just to, don't bring your kids to this well you can bring your kids to this event just don't do the demos of sorcerer keep them on the other side you don't want they you don't want them seeing the art in this game but now more importantly for those of you listening to the podcast the saturday after that i don't know my dates i'm going to click on my calendar really quick so it is the 17th of august we are going to have another game night at easy mode uh this is a free open game night show up play games bring games to play i don't have anything specific planned i'm going to bring a milk crate full of games i'm not going to use one of these tools to select games i'm going to use my own knowledge of i'm going to bring a mix of heavy games to play with people like chad and i'm going to bring a bunch of light games to play with brand new people who showed up like last week hoping to get some new gamers to this out um as well, if you dig video games, you can play video games there. They got like Smash Brother tournaments and you can sit down and play League of Legends and all that stuff. Uh, we did have some people doing both last week, which was cool. The last time. And hopefully I will be digging into this box, which arrived oh. <laughs> and uh, getting into that as uh, a few things arrived on the doorstop this week earlier than expected. Uh, nice. And uh, we'll see how that goes. For those listening, Sean just held up a big Amazon box, which I happen to know there was a really good sale on DAC deck building games for Gen Con. So I'm pretty yeah. sure that's what's in that box. So we are just about at the end of the show. I don't think there's a lot going in our lobby. Anything else before we head on? I did see some Mensa notes. So uh, people are confused, uh, a little confused because we're wondering how a 20, uh, Angie Games was asking how a 2015 game can win the Mensa Select of 2018. Uh, and to be honest, I can't answer that question because going over to the Mensa website, it does say new release uh, or new games, new new production games. So I'm not quite <laughs> sure how that works, but I'm not going to knock it. Okay, um, I, I'm wondering if maybe I'm not that late to the party. Is it possible Raiders of the North Sea came out in Germany in 2015 and didn't come out in North America until 2018? It's possible. So maybe I'm not that far off. Like, I admit, it's still not the new hotness for this year. That's Paladins of the West Kingdom from, from them. That's the new hotness everyone's talking about. Or Architects of the East. 
Kingdom, East something, uh, was the one from last year. So it's it's possible I'm not quite as late to the party. I just know when I looked it up from Board Geek, I was like, ooh, 2015. Well, wow. well, interestingly, the Ken- it, see, it says a 2015, but the Kenner Spiel de Jar nominee was 2017. So yeah, that so doesn't match the- up either. Um, yeah, I don't know what is going on with that game. Yeah, I, It's a good game. That's all I can say. The Mensa people dig it. I dig it too. Um, see, Deanna is pretty sure she played it a couple of years back, which was probably Jamie's copy. Um, so I definitely hadn't played it. Um, it was 2018 when I first saw it at Origins, but it wasn't like their new hotness. It was more of a, I swear they were trying to sell me expansions. They're like, check out Raves on North Sea and these expansions. And I'm like, I don't even know the base game. And I apologize for not remembering her name, but the the social the the PR rep from the game from Renegade Games sat down and showed me how to play. But we didn't play a game. It just was like, oh, here's the cool thing: is the whole take it off, put it down, and take a different one off to do two actions is still amazing. So uh, I'm just going through the versioning on BGG right now. So uh, the English first edition came out in 2015. The German Raubler der Nordsee came out in 2016, which would give it the that Spiel des Jahres for, for 2017. Yeah. Uh, but I can't explain what... Oh, the English second edition came out in 2017, which would get so it maybe, into Mensa for 2018. I, I guess, sure. So they, they, if they, they didn't work. submit for the first edition and then did submit it for the second edition, yeah. that would put it in the... Uh, uh, and and trash, thank you. Yeah, trash thank you, Trash Arama. It's Sarah. Sarah. Sarah Erickson. That is definitely who taught um, Terry Latorco is now one of their reps, who's someone from Windsor, which is awesome. She's the one that hooked me up with the review copy. Uh, so I think I mentioned that during the review. Just in full disclosure, I did receive a free review copy in payment for the review I posted. No other payment was received by Renegade Games. Uh, and Raiders, uh, Enchi Games is pointing out, the Raiders is one of her favorite games, but yeah. do not break it out for tipsy folks. Yeah. She had fun, but she already knew how to play. Uh, yeah. Learning a new thinky game while drunk is blah. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I totally legit. Like, I played fine. Deanna and I were literally one point apart. Like, Deanna won by one point. It was a close game. Kat did pretty good for not having played before, but Tori did have a hard time grasping the concept. Because it is. It's something unique. That whole take a worker off doesn't sound like a big deal, but the thought process, like, oh, man, when you go to take a spot and it's already taken, like, there's some real interesting things going on there where you're like, oh, I need to raid, so I need plunder, but there's someone on there, so I need to hire the, oh, there's someone on there too, so I guess I'm going to go here to get the silver. Oh, now that I got the silver, maybe I want to take this guy off instead of the plunder. Like, there's some really neat stuff going on with that. Right. All right. Thank you, those of you in the lobby. All right. And now, a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our Patreon backers. Their support helps make this show possible. Joe Swick, thank you. Jeff Seuss, thank you. William Fisher, thanks. Danielle Thomas, great to see you in the chat room again tonight. And a big welcome to our newest patron, the man with the best hair in gaming, Sean P. Kelly, from the excellent Gaming and BS podcast, which I got to give credit to as one of the shows, along with the misdirected Mark, that helped inspire this show here. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and in social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can also find us on Board Game Geek as guild number 3347. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. And if you like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast to hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. Eastern every Tuesday. You can also catch the table- Bellhop's Tabletop Twitch Friday nights at 8.30. We mostly play Gloomhaven, but now and then we'll surprise you with something else. <laughs> well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us. Hang around and join us in the penthouse suite for the Off the Books After Show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you, and game on.